Good afternoon. I'm Kevin Brennan with the Notre Dame Alumni Association. Thanks for joining us for another edition of ND Conversations. Today we'll be exploring the ethical dimensions of fracking, and we're lucky enough to have two expert Notre Dame faculty members uh, joining us to enlighten us on the subject. Tiago Bolster is a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and Earth Sciences, and Tom Frecka is a professor emeritus from the Mendoza College of Business. Before we hear from our experts today, we thought it might be nice to quickly give some background on fracking, on, on fracking to myself and the other non-experts uh, among us. We're going to show a short video that will uh, explain fracking to you, and afterwards we'll get into the presentations and our question and answer session. So with that, here's, here's the video. Geologists have known for years that substantial deposits of oil and natural gas are trapped in deep shale formations. These shale reservoirs were created tens of millions of years ago. Around the world today, with modern horizontal drilling techniques and hydraulic fracturing, the trapped oil and natural gas in these shale reservoirs is being safely and efficiently produced, gathered, and distributed to customers. Let's look at the drilling and completion process of a typical oil and natural gas well. Shale reservoirs are usually one mile or more below the surface, well below any underground source of drinking water, which is typically no more than 300 to 1,000 feet below the surface. Additionally, steel pipes, called casing, cemented in place, provide a multi-layered barrier to protect freshwater aquifers. During the past 60 years, the oil and gas industry has conducted fracture stimulations in over one million wells worldwide. The initial steps are the same as for any conventional well. A hole is drilled straight down using fresh water-based fluids, which cools the drill bit, carries the rock cuttings back to the surface, and stabilizes the wall of the well bore. Once the hole extends below the deepest freshwater aquifer, the drill pipe is removed and replaced with steel pipe, called surface casing. Next, cement is pumped down the casing. When it reaches the bottom, it is pumped down and then back up between the casing and the borehole wall, creating an impermeable additional protective barrier between the well bore and any freshwater sources. In some cases, depending on the geology of the area and the depth of the well, additional casing sections may be run and, like surface casing, are then cemented in place to ensure no movement of fluids or gas between those layers and the groundwater sources. What makes drilling for hydrocarbons in a shale formation unique is the necessity to drill horizontally. Vertical drilling continues to a depth called the kickoff point. This is where the well bore begins curving to become horizontal. One of the advantages of horizontal drilling is that it's possible to drill several wells from only one drilling pad, minimizing the impact to the surface environment. When the targeted distance is reached, the drill pipe is removed and additional steel casing is inserted through the full length of the well bore. Once again, the casing is cemented in place. For some horizontal developments, new technology in the form of sliding sleeves and mechanical isolation devices replace cement in the creation of isolations along the well bore. Once the drilling is finished and the final casing has been installed, the drilling rig is removed and preparations are made for the next steps, well completion. The first step in completing a well is the creation of a connection between the final casing and the reservoir rock. This consists of lowering a specialized tool called a perforating gun, which is equipped with shaped explosive charges, down to the rock layer containing oil or natural gas. This perforating gun is then fired, which creates holes through the casing, cement, and into the target rock. These perforating holes connect the reservoir and the well bore. Since these perforations are only a few inches long and are performed more than a mile underground, the entire process is imperceptible on the surface. The perforation gun is then removed in preparation for the next step, hydraulic fracturing. The process consists of pumping a mixture of mostly water and sand, plus a few chemicals, under controlled conditions into deep underground reservoir formations. The chemicals are generally for lubrication, to keep bacteria from forming, and help carry the sand. 
These chemicals typically range in concentrations from 0.1 to 0.5% by volume and help to improve the performance of the stimulation. This stimulation fluid is sent to trucks that pump the fluid into the well bore and out through the perforations that were noted earlier. This process creates fractures in the oil and gas reservoir rock. The sand in the frac fluid remains in these fractures in the rock and keeps them open when the pump pressure is relieved. This allows the previously trapped oil or natural gas to flow to the well bore more easily. This initial stimulation segment is then isolated with a specially designed plug and the perforating guns are used to perforate the next stage. This stage is then hydraulically fractured in the same manner. This process is repeated along the entire horizontal section of the well, which can extend several miles. Once the stimulation is complete, the isolation plugs are drilled out and production begins. Initially water and then natural gas or oil flows into the horizontal casing and up the well bore. In the course of initial production of the well, approximately 15 to 50 percent of the fracturing fluid is recovered. This fluid is either recycled to be used on other fracturing operations or safely disposed of according to government regulations. The whole process of developing a well typically takes from three to five months, a few weeks to prepare the site, four to six weeks to drill the well, and then one to three months of completion activities, which includes one to seven days of stimulation. But this three to five month investment can result in a well that will produce oil or natural gas for 20 to 40 years or more. When all of the oil or natural gas that can be recovered economically from a reservoir has been produced, work begins to return the land to the way it was before the drilling operations commenced. Wells will be filled with cement and pipes cut off three to six feet below ground level. All surface equipment will be removed and all pads will be filled in with dirt or replanted. The land can then be used again by the landowner for other activities and there will be virtually no visual signs that a well was once there. Today, hydraulic fracturing has become an increasingly important technique for producing oil and natural gas in places where the hydrocarbons were previously inaccessible. Technology will continue to be developed to improve the safe and economic development of oil and gas resources. All right, so now we've learned a little bit uh, back, more background information on fracking. We're going to start with our presentations. For those of you uh, joining us for the first time for any conversations, um, after the the presentations will have a question and answer session um, where our faculty members will be answering your questions. To submit a question, you can do so using the Q&A panel on the bottom right hand side of your screen. You can submit questions throughout the, today's event and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can as time allows. And with that, uh, Professor Bolster, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. So first, uh, thank you for asking me to come along and to those of you attending, thanks for listening to me. <clears throat> so as was mentioned, I'm a professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Earth Sciences. So my talk is going to come to you from that perspective. So let me start by talking about the good news, right? Why, why are we, as people who care about the environment, excited about the idea of shale and shale gas? Well, many people argue natural gas is a clean energy. Right? It's, it's much, much cleaner than, than other things. So it produces about half as much CO2 as other fuels, such as, for example, oil, and significantly less than coal. Right? So if you're concerned with greenhouse gas emissions and climate change, that's good news. Right? There is also significantly less other nasty things in there, such as nitrogen oxides uh, and sulfur oxides, which can cause problems such as acid rain and ground level ozone. However, um, one thing that we need to be aware of, right, and we need to know is that methane, which is the dominant component of natural gas, is 70 times more potent than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. So we need to be really, really careful about not letting too much of that methane, if we're extracting, escape to the atmosphere. Otherwise, we could be adding to the problem of climate change. So really briefly, what's the biggest difference between shale gas production and conventional gas production. Well, if you look at the figure that I've got there, you can see on the right-hand side, on the right upper-hand side, 
That's what a typical gas or oil reservoir might look like. You have lots of solid material, so you can think of that as being like a sand or a gravel or something like that, with lots of empty space between it, which is filled with gas and through which the gas can flow. When you go through a shale, and you can see a photograph of what a typical shale looks like on the bottom right-hand side, um, you have a slightly different story. The shale is packed together very, very tightly. You can see there you've got flat layers of rock which are really, really impermeable. So it's much, much more difficult for the natural gas to flow through there uh, and to extract, in essence. And that is essentially what fracking has allowed us to do, is to extract natural gas from formations like that. So these are current estimates, right? So current estimates of shale gas resources in the United States um, are at about 862 trillion cubic feet in the continental United States. Industry claims we can recover 827 trillion uh, cubic feet. Now, for any of you who are familiar with oil and natural gas extraction, that is a huge rate of recovery, right? Many, many, in many traditional oil fields, anything like that, we're lucky if we get 40% of what's available there. So that looks pretty good. Um, right now, the total amount of natural gas that's available in the United States is roughly 2,000 uh, trillion cubic feet, right? And we typically consume on the order of 25 per year, about one from three from shale gas right now. So right there you can see more or less what this TCF unit is, but if this gives you a proportion, an idea of the amount of natural gas that's available. If you look at natural gas production in the United States right now, you can see that currently, so if you look at that line around 2010, which is fairly representative of where we are right now, okay, we're a little bit further, you can see that there's quite a diverse range of where we're getting our natural gas from, right? So from conventional sources, offshore, onshore, but there's quite a, a solid mix of the two. If you look at the projections that go out into the future, so to around 2035, you can see that it's estimated that shale gas production will make up about 50% of the natural gas that is consumed and used in the United States. That's a pretty substantial number. So we really want to make sure that we're doing it right when we're moving forward. Where is the natural gas in the United States? This is a map of the current shale formations that exist across the United States. Some of you might be familiar with this. If you look at the right upper hand corner, so the Pennsylvania and New York area, you'll see the Marcellus Shale. That's probably one of the most famous shales, the one that's gotten most of the media controversy. But the main reason I'm putting up this figure is I want you guys to look and, and essentially notice these shales are all over the United States. To me, that raises an important question. It really highlights that this is not a state-by-state state problem. This is a domestic problem. This is a federal uh, problem. This is something that we need to consider across the entire country, not just in an individual state, because the decisions we make have implications for the entire country. In terms of where is, you know, where is most of the activity taking place right now, um, I think this is a particularly interesting graph, because you can see here that these are the different shale reservoirs that are being exploited. Again, the amount of uh, shale gas that's being produced from these. And, and what I find most interesting here is that even though the Marcellus Shale is probably the most famous one, so the Marcellus Shale, again, just to remind you, is the one in Pennsylvania, New York area, even though that's probably the most famous one, the one that's got the most media attention, it's actually the Barnett Shale, which if I go back here, is a shale in Texas, which has produced the most natural gas um, right now. And also you can see that there is, again, a broad mix from across the entire country. So we already saw in the video what exactly fracking technology is, so I won't delve into this too much more, right? But the, the, main, the first thing I want everybody to be aware of is that this is not a new technology per se, right? It's actually been around since the 1940s. Um, so if any of you are asking, well, why haven't we been using it since the 1940s? Well, that's because we only really had advances in this horizontal drilling technology, which was again discussed in the video. That happened in the 80s and 90s. So all of these technologies had to come together in order to make fracking, as we do it nowadays, feasible. Again, this is an image just to convey kind of where fracking happens and how it happens. And the purpose of this figure, if you look at the top right-hand side, so on the right-hand side, you can see a geologic cross-section of the area that we're interested in. On the top, you can see uh, the region where we're essentially creating the well and extracting the natural gas. If you go down couple of hundred feet down to a depth of about 1,000 feet, you have, typically, you have freshwater aquifers where many of us extract our water from. A uh, good example, here at Notre Dame, 
South Bend, Mishawaka, the vast majority of the water that comes out of our taps comes from the local aquifer, right? All this activity with fracking is taking place at a depth of around 8,000 feet. So in principle, that's good news. You've got 7,000 feet of protection zone, right? So you've got 7,000 feet where you don't run the risk of contaminating water that is valuable to us as human beings. But let's think about like what are the environmental implications of shale gas development? Well, first of all, the top one, the drill pad construction and operation. Well, simply speaking, that just means you know, you're building the drill pad, you're building this area, and if you happen to be going into a very scenic area, as many of these places are, you're creating an eyesore. Right? So that we consider that to be some form of environmental pollution. As stated in the video, the goal would be that when the operation is finished, you clean and restore it to its original state. But something to worry about. The next is groundwater contamination. This is probably the most controversial issue that has been associated with fracking. Uh, and I'll get into that a little more. Hydraulic fracturing and uh, flowback water management. Again, detail. Blowouts and house explosions. So anytime you're working with natural gas or things under high pressure, that's something that you need to worry about. Water consumption and supply. It turns out that in order to be able to frack these aquifers, you need quite a substantial amount of water. And we really have to ask ourselves, is this the best use of water, um, given that we're in drought conditions in large parts of the country, and given that many of our water resources are already strained? We need to be careful um, with spill management and surface water protection. And then last but not least, there's a concern that if we're messing around with the subsurface, so we're injecting fluids into the subsurface, are we changing the structure? Are we changing the properties of the subsurface? And can this cause earthquakes? There is evidence, for example, that small earthquakes have been triggered by these kind of activities. This raises a potential concern, uh, something we should think about. Again, this is a figure just to bring you back to the picture of what's going on. You've got the gas production on the top, your aquifer, which you aim to protect, protect and then at great depth, you have the shale formation uh, from which you're extracting natural gas. As an engineer, I would look at this and think, I'm extracting all my gas from 8,000 feet. The thing I'm interested in protecting is at less than 1,000 feet. I'm in good shape. I should not be causing any trouble. However, I want to show you guys this video. Some of you might have already seen it. It's a pretty dramatic video, and it highlights uh, in a dramatic way some of the concerns that people might have. Whoa, Jesus Christ. Am I good? All right. So that video is from the, the film Gasland, which uh, some of you may, as I say, it's very dramatic and uh, clearly coming from a biased perspective. But the main point there is that this gentleman claims that pre-fracking in his area, so this, this gentleman lives in Pennsylvania, he could not set his water on fire. Now that fracking has occurred, he can set his tap water on fire because there are sufficiently large amounts of natural gas contaminating the local water and entering through his tap. I don't know about you, but I think I'd be pretty scared if I could set my tap water on fire. Anyway, the controversy. Controversy number one, that there is migration of fracture fluids right, and or methane to aquifers. Well, industry would tell you that there's no evidence of fracturing fluids found in aquifers, and thus they argue that all is well. I would tend to agree with them in this regard. It is highly unlikely, improbable, that fracture fluids can migrate all the way from that 8,000 foot depth to the 1,000 feet that we're concerned about. Right? But there are other ways in which it can get there. Um, the other thing is, really, I mean, if any of you have ever worked in geology in any way, shape, or form, is you know, wh while we have a very good understanding of geology, it's also massively uncertain. So we just really, really don't know what the subsurface looks like all that well. And we don't have an idea as to whether there are, by fracturing uh, the subsurface, are we creating connections between this 8,000 feet and this 1,000 uh, foot depth? How do these fractures that we're creating interact with other features that we've already put in the subsurface? For example, oil fields, which we've extracted at a later point, which can then create connections back to the surface. These are all really, really legitimate concerns and things we should think about. One of the main things I want to go back and highlight is that the industry says there's no evidence of fracturing fluids found in aquifers. That's not to say that there's no evidence of natural gas leaking into these aquifers being found. So again, this figure, repetitive, same as the moat, is trying to highlight 
you look down at the bottom, that's the reason we're fracturing, right? Can that, can that region, which is at around 8,000 feet, affect the water that we're interested in, right, which is much closer to the surface? And if you look in this figure, the idea behind it is showing you, we can see that we've created a series of new fractures. That's the, the gray and white feature in that black formation at the bottom. And what's being argued is that that might connect into fractures which already existed in the overlying formation. That's something to, concern, uh, to be concerned about. However, the argument is if that connection does not exist, right, well, then you're extracting everything through these pipes, right? So that's the figure on the top left of the figure, which has several layers of protection. So any natural gas that is coming through there should not leak into the adjacent aquifer. However, this is a study, and I don't want to bog you guys down with the figures, but this is a study that was published in the Proceedings uh, of the National Academy of Science. And what it basically shows is that if you measure methane or natural gas concentrations, right, in waters close to gas wells, what you find is you do find a significantly larger concentration of natural gas in those waters than you do at distance, great distances from them. So we really have to ask ourselves, we've just been told we're not going to get this vertical migration from 8,000 feet to 1,000 feet, or it's highly unlikely. We're told we have all these casings, but where is it coming from, right? Well, if you look at it, right, there is a big, big problem um, with many of these casings. And this is a well-known fact. The casings, uh, if you look at the figure on the bottom left, industry would have you believe that these casings look beautiful, they're perfect, they're fantastic, extremely well designed as an engineer. Um, but if you look at the photographs, the one in the middle and the right-hand side, they don't look quite as much as that beautiful graphic does. And you can see on the right that, in fact, you have holes in the concrete lining through which the natural gas could escape. Um, there are several reasons for this, right? And, and one, of the, one of the good, like, the bad news is, yes, we know this has happened. The good news is we're aware it's happened. And industry is getting better at creating better and better casings to make sure that future contaminations like this do not occur. The second controversy, right, relates to these fracking fluids. So these are the fluids that are added to the water in order to create this fracturing. Um, and, and their primary purpose is to lubricate and to kill bacteria uh, as they're going underground. Now, as stated in the video, and it's true, these, these fracking fluids um, make up less than 1% of the water that is injected underground. The vast bulk of it is simply water and sand. Right? These additives are, I mean, there's nothing magic to these things. These additives are common. They're things that you will find in your household. Right? However, if you look at the list of additives, there are some pretty nasty things in there. You can see here we've got naphthalene, which is a known, or probable carcinogen. Benzene, which is a known carcinogen. 2BE, which destroys red blood cells, among, amongst other effects. Even in low concentrations, these can be quite dangerous. Yes, they're widely used in household products, but I highly doubt any of you would go open your bottle of cleaning detergent, mix it with some water, and drink it down. It's just something to be aware of, right, and something to know. And the point is that for a single lateral, we are using between 15,000 and 60,000 gallons of this additive. Now, here's another point. If we're using 15 to 60,000 gallons of additives, and they are less than 1% of the total amount of water that we're injecting into the subsurface, right? That means we must be using an enormous amount of water to create these fracked zones. Typically, we're talking about 4 to 6 million gallons per well. So the EPA has estimated that if 35,000 wells are hydraulically fractured each year in the United States, which is not an unreasonable number, this is equivalent to the amount of water that is consumed by 5 million people. So we realistically, I mean, water is a strained resource. If any of you connected here today are connected from the West, you are more aware of this than many of the rest of us. In the East Coast, we tend to worry more about water quality than water quantity. But we really do have to ask ourselves a question. Is, could, should we be using precious water resources for this? The answer may well be yes. But it's something that we very seriously need to think about. So that brings me to the end of uh, what I really wanted to talk about. Just in case any of you are interested after this to look up and see, um, read anything else, most of the information that I got uh, comes from this report, as well as some of these nice uh, articles. The first one in particular that was published in Scientific American in 2001 is very accessible and uh, can be read by a lay audience, so I'd encourage any of you who are interested to go and read it.
And thanks for your time. Hi, welcome to uh, this presentation. Uh, it's a beautiful day here in uh, South Bend today. High about 55, nice and sunny day. Unlike last Saturday when it was really miserable here. Fortunately, uh, people uh, who went to the game were, were re uh, rewarded with a victory. Um, about five years ago, Notre Dame decided that it would uh, offer a couple of uh, new minors, one minor in sustainability and another minor in um, energy. And um, there is a professor, um, uh, Jessica Hellman in biology, who was uh, formed a committee to establish a sustainability minor, and a professor, Joan Brennecke in engineering, who worked to uh, develop the uh, energy minor. Both minors are about uh, 15 credit hours, and they usually consist of about two uh, uh, required courses each with a uh, capstone course on top. And uh, I'm pleased to announce that um, both majors are doing very well, very popular with students. Um, I actually teach a course in the um, energy minor uh, program called the Business of Energy. And um, I'm an accounting professor. Um, before I taught the energy course, I didn't know any more about energy than the cost of gasoline at the pump. But uh, I spent a lot of time uh, studying, talking to people, and researching. Uh, so um, I've um, really enjoyed teaching this um, Business of Energy course. Um, one of the uh, high fracking areas that Diego uh, talked about was um, the Bakken Shale area, which is located in uh, northwest North Dakota, and, uh, part of Montana, and, and part of Saskatchewan in, in uh, Canada. Um, now, I was wondering, have any of you guys um, ever decided to vacation in North Dakota? <laughs> well, um, this summer, uh, my wife and I visited um, our daughter in Minneapolis. Uh, we have three kids, actually, um, and Julie's the one who escaped from Notre Dame. She actually graduated from Purdue, whereas our other two graduated from Notre Dame. Um, but uh, we decided to visit her and her husband. and. Uh, after that, we were going to take a trip out to uh, South Dakota and visit uh, Mount Rushmore and the uh, Chief Crazy Horse Monument. And since I'm teaching this energy course, I thought it might be good to take a side trip and uh, visit uh, this fracking area in uh, North Dakota. So we did so. Um, we started out um, in Minneapolis on I-94, drove over to Fargo and then took this um, beautiful drive on uh, I-94 out to uh, Dixon, Dickinson, North Dakota. Uh, so a beautiful drive. You can speed along in the highway at about 75 or 80 miles an hour. Uh, nice rolling landscape with a lot of corn, soybeans, uh, wheat, and uh, sunflowers. Uh, so I was really surprised. It was my first uh, trip to North Dakota. and. Uh, I found it to be a very beautiful state. But uh, eventually, you have to turn on to Route 85 and drive about 120 miles north to Williston, North Dakota, the center of the fracking area. And um, Route 85 is a two-lane road, um, which is under construction now, uh, converting it to a four-lane road. And um, here's some of the traffic uh, on the highway on your way to uh, Williston. So a lot, of, a lot of the time, you could only drive 20 or 25 miles an hour uh, over this stretch of, of um, Route 85. Um, one of the things that's uh, happened in this area is a lot of production workers have um, taken up temporary residence there. This is uh, what's called a typical man camp. So for instance, in Williston, North Dakota, the typical pop population of the town is about 15 to 20,000, but there's another 40,000 workers um, working uh, to um, produce Bach and shale oil in this area. And they live, at, live in these um, less than uh, um, expansive uh, housing developments called man camps. Uh, so that's one example. This, is, this picture is called an average man camp. So 
again, you see the small houses or temporary houses in Australia as they live in. Uh, typical worker up there um, works um, a 12-hour day for about a two-week period, uh, seven days a week, and then um, typically goes back home to his family for two weeks and then comes back again in another two weeks. So um, that's the reason for the temporary housing. Uh, this map is hard to see, but it's an example of the um, number of um, shale oil wells that have been developed in this area. Um, this is um, along the Missouri um, River Basin area, and there's a big lake there whose name I've forgotten. But um, in this area, they're drilling now about um, 2,100 uh, new wells each year. And they expect to continue at that pace for another five or six years. So um, because of the development of the Bach and Shale um, site, um, North Dakota has now uh, surpassed Alaska as the uh, second leading oil producing state in the nation, second only to Texas at this point. Quicker stop working. Okay, so uh, that's a typical uh, oil drilling site there. Um, and uh, let's click on the next one as well. Quicker is waiting. Okay. Another example. And then there, there's a pristine example. Uh, I think uh, Diego sh actually showed this example in his presentation as well. Uh, so. Well, that uh, previous slide showing the number of oil wells looks very dense. If you look at the horizon, uh, they're probably typically a mile or two apart on average. And Diego, Diego focused on uh, natural gas production, but uh, the Bakken Shale is an oil field production site. And um, since they don't have any pipelines or ways of uh, capturing uh, economically, the uh, natural gas that uh, comes out of the wells, they have to flare it off. So this is a typical example of flaring off of natural gas. And uh, because of the flaring of natural gas that's taking place uh, in the Bakken area, there is a night sky picture of Bakken. And you can compare the light in that area with the light uh, in Minneapolis in the lower right hand corner of the, uh, of the map. Then. OK, and um, since they don't have um, pipelines to uh, ship this oil, most of it is shipped on uh, railroad oil tank cars. And you just see mile after mile of these tank cars on sightings uh, in that area. Um, there, one of the uh, pipeline companies is going to build a pipeline to Wisconsin and that will alleviate some of this um, rail traffic. Um, so um, we're going to get into the ethics of fracking at this point, at least my uh, perspective on the ethics of fracking. So first of all, there are important benefits of fracking technology. Uh, it does help us to meet energy demand that is expected to increase by at least 35% by the year 2040 as our present world population of 7.3 billion increases to almost 9 billion people. Um, secondly, um, access to energy does reduce poverty and increases global prosperity. Uh, fracking is enabling the US to become energy independent. While Saudi Arabia is the largest uh, oil producer in the world, the uh, United States is now the largest combined oil and gas producer in the world. So. It's helping us to uh, become energy independent. And clearly, it's also helping us to develop our economy, producing a large number of jobs, including uh, the jobs that I mentioned uh, in the Bakken fracking area. On the other hand, there's this laundry list of uh, concerns. Diego has covered most of these. Um, I would mention, first of all, though, that uh, if you don't like fossil fuel usage in general, you won't like fracking. Um, you won't like it because of it's a non-renewable source of energy. 
because it creates uh, greenhouse gases because of climate change issues and things of that nature. Um, and then um, Diego, Diego mentioned the release of methane. Uh, his methane is my methane, by the way, but um, that's um, a problem in that uh, if it's not carefully controlled, uh, it's a highly concentrated form of greenhouse gas that uh, can um, lead to a lot of problems in the atmosphere. Mentioned the toxic chemicals. Um, I mentioned the flaring off of natural gas that's occurring. Um, potential for seismic activity. <clears throat> Effects of failure well, uh, well, ca well casings. Potential seismic activity. Um, something that um, is occurring in the Bakken uh, shale area is issues regarding the disposal of low level radioactive waste. Uh, there's transportation issues. So I mentioned the uh, fact that a lot of this oil is shipped um, by rail now. So is that a safe way of transporting it? Uh, how about pipelines? And then, of course, um, various uh, temporary social concerns associated with uh, boom towns like Williston. So um, these are some of the issues that we have to consider in considering the uh, ethics of uh, fracking. But um, my position on energy production in general is, first of all, um, due to the externalities that are produced by using fossil fuels, I do believe that there should be a carbon tax on fossil fuels. However, I don't believe that a fossil fuel tax is politically feasible at the national lead level in the United States. And therefore, we will probably need to uh, rely on uh, continued what I call inefficient subsidies of renewables if we want to encourage the use of uh, more renewable energy sources. Um, and then I also believe that given all the energy demands we have, uh, we can't afford to give up on any forms of energy, including coal, oil, natural gas, nuclear, wind, solar, whatever is part of the mix then. At the same time, uh, I strongly believe that we need to uh, minimize the risks and harms associated with the um, use of fossil fuels and fracking. But uh, I've come up with a model uh, for uh, doing what I call minimizing the risk and harm associated with uh, energy production. And uh, this model consists of four parts. Um, number one, I believe that we need uh, strong hard law mechanisms global laws, federal st uh, laws, state laws, and local laws that uh, help us to um, minimize the risk and harm associated with fracking. But uh, lawmaking is very complex, takes a long time. It tends to lag the demands of society. So in addition to the soft law, hard law mechanisms, we need what I call soft law mechanisms. We need uh, NGOs, we need environmentalists, we need the United Nations, and we need researchers to shine a bright light on uh, energy production, make us aware of problems, and um, help us to um, develop laws and regulations to minimize these problems. Um, thirdly, we need uh, compliance mechanisms. We need firms, we need auditors, we need disclosures in financial statements. We need transparency in general as a third part of this model. And unfortunately, in my opinion, there's not enough transparency in the uh, oil and gas industry um, in regard to some of these issues that uh, Diego, Diego, Diego has mentioned. And finally, we need strong enforcement mechanisms. We need law enforcement agencies. We need the EPA. We need fines and penalties. Uh, all these things need to be done to uh, limit the harm and risk associated with fracking. So uh, is ethic fr ethic, uh, fracking ethical? Uh, I believe it is because it provides a low-cost source of energy to an energy-starved world. Uh, I believe it's ethical because it provides jobs and reduces poverty. I believe it's uh, ethical because it increases our energy independence. But at the same time, we do need this system of controls in place to minimize the risk and harm and, and risk and to eliminate the harm associated with fracking. 
and uh, obviously uh, our present system does need some improvements then. So um, I think that's all we have to say, and uh, we're ready for any questions that uh, you guys have. Great. Thanks. For those of you watching live, remember you can submit your questions using the Q&A panel on the bottom right-hand side of your screen, and we'll try to get to as, uh, as many of them as we can. Um, Professor Frecker, you were talking there kind of about the uh, how we need to do a better job of sort of regulating and, and, and minimizing the risks. Because this is a relatively new practice and a growing practice, what what are sort of the regulations that are currently in, in place surrounding fracking, and how how effective are they right now? How, how much ground do we need to make up? Well, there's um, regulations at the federal, state, and local levels, uh, but regulation is very complex, and there's a lot of holes in regulation. Yeah. Um, so, for instance, um, um, one EPA um, regulation exempts fracking from um, water regulations. It's called the Clean Water Act. Clean Water Act, <clears throat> yeah. And um, some people are concerned about that. Interesting. Um, we also had a question about the casings, which we uh, we discussed earlier. It, it seems like, as, as you mentioned, that the, if there's a problem with, with you know insufficient casings, that should be an easy fix. Industry makes better casings. But um, we have a question from one of our viewers, Mike, who says, how does the creation of better and better casings in the future address the issues of existing defective casings? And w will industry be replacing those? It's a, it's a great question, and the, the, the honest answer is it doesn't, right? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a big concern. Um, so in terms of will they replace the existing ones, I'm not, I'm not an expert on, on this, so I, I say this as my opinion. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. I mean, pulling these things out, uh, I don't even know how possible that is, going in and replacing them and fixing them. Uh, so, so it's an excellent question, and I honestly don't don't have an answer for it. Uh, at the same time, I'm very glad that if we're going to continue doing this at the kind of rates that Tom was mentioning, um, I'm very glad that the technology is getting better. But it's, I mean, it's really interesting. Um, it's not just a fracking issue; it's a oil well issue in general. So we've got what millions of ho holes in the ground right now, um, not only from fracking but other forms of drilling. So uh, is that a problem? What's going to what's going to happen in 100 years or 200 years? So you you raise a really interesting point and something that I'd like to add to that. So so one of the one of the biggest reasons why they've had such difficulty or such problems with fracking and the casing is that in some sense what the what industry did is they used the exact same method that they had used for conventional oil and gas extraction. And uh, you know if you pay attention to the video that you saw at the beginning and if you think about it, the pressures associated with fracking are so, 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 so high that they, you start getting failures